Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to today's webinar. Um, as part of the as part of the Ensemble um, training series, my name's Emily Perry. I'm the Ensemble Outreach Project Leader. Um, and just to go over some admin stuff to do uh, with these webinars. So what we're trying to get over over the course um, of the, the seven weeks of these webinars is what Ensemble is, what kind of data you can get in Ensemble, how to navigate the Ensemble browser website, and where to go. This is my favorite one for help and documentation. Um, so this webinar course, we're now on the 13th of April, so today we're talking about Ensemble genes. Um, those of you who were here last week or have watched the video from last week um, will have seen Helen give an introduction and look at the um, region in detail view. Next week we'll have Victoria talking about Biomart, then we'll have variation data, um, then we'll move on to Ben's webinars on comparing genes and genomes, finding features that regulate genes, and then finally I'll be back to talk about uploading data to Ensemble and advanced ways to access Ensemble data. Um, so each of the webinars has a particular structure. We start with a presentation. Um, so in this case, we'll be talking about where Ensemble genes come from. We'll follow that up with a demo showing you how to get um, gene and transcript data through the browser. And then we'll have some exercises which are available on the Train Online course, um, which some of you have um, possibly accessed already, but I'll point you how to get there again. If you have any questions, um, we've muted all the mics. But the webinar interface, uh, whether you're on the, the web interface or the, um, the sort of standalone pop-up box thing, has got a chat box. Um, please type any questions as they come up. It's very hard for me to see the questions while I'm talking. So my colleagues, Ben and Victoria, are in the room with me. They'll be watching the chat box to see if there are any questions, um, and they will answer those. There is no threading, so if you're replying to somebody, if Ben gives you an answer and you want to, to ask him a bit more, if you put at Ben, he'll know that it's, it's directed at him. Um, and he'll do the same thing um, if you, you ask um, when he's replying to your questions. The course exercises, as I pointed out, are on the, the Train Online course. Um, so the text, there's a bit of sort of filler text there at the moment. That'll be replaced by the um, YouTube video of this webinar and a PDF of the slides. There'll be um, a next page link with the exercises. Um, if you are doing the exercises and you are struggling, we do have a Facebook group that you can join. Um, some of you might be members already. You can discuss the exercises with everybody um, and the link to that is in the online course. And you can also email us. We are helpdesk at ensemble.org. So today I'm talking about genes and transcript in Ensemble. Um, so we saw a bit in the last webinar uh, where we were looking at the region in detail view, what genes look like. Um, so this is a gene, this is BRCA2, plotted against the genome. Um, and there's lots of things that I can tell about this gene just by looking at this particular image. For example, I can tell that it's on the forward strand. As Helen mentioned last week, there are lots of um, features in the genome that are stranded. Genes are one of them. And stranded features are always plotted above this blue bar that you see here. Anything that's above that that's stranded is um, on the forward strand. Anything that's below that blue bar is on the reverse strand. Um, there are a couple of other pointers as well. So these are all transcripts of BRCA2. They're all named, named BRCA2, followed by a three-digit number. Um, and then there's an arrow, um, which is pointing to the right. That's showing us the direction of transcription. If they were being um, transcribed in the opposite way, we'd have an arrow pointing to the left. We also have introns, which is shown as these sort of peaks. Um, and on the forward strand, they're shown as these sort of mountain peaks. If we're on the reverse strand, you see kind of valleys um, pointing downwards instead. Um, so I pointed out that those were introns. We can also see the exons as blocks. Um, so coding exons are colored in blocks. Non-coding exons, you can see the, the untranslated region at the end of that transcript at the top. That's shown um, as an empty box. Um, so these different transcripts of the same gene, we have uh, the non-coding transcript shown in blue. Red ones are protein coding, and gold ones are what we call merged transcripts. Now, these are all protein coding, 
um, and they're merged because they're, they're annotated by two different methods. The two different methods um, are called Ensemble Automatic and Havana Manual Annotation. Um, and we can tell what annotation method was used for them by the, the numbers on the transcript as well. So this red one you can see start, has a number bracket 2 and then it's 201. Because it starts with a 2, we know that it's only had the Ensemble Automatic Annotation. Um, this red one lower down, uh, 003, we know that it's only have the, had the Havana, Havana Manual Annotation. This one at the top, we know that it's had both because it's gold, but it's always named, the ones that are merges are always named with the zero. Um, so the golden transcripts, because they're identical annotation between these two different methods, um, we consider them to be of higher confidence and quality. And we have these for human, mouse, zebrafish, pig, and rat. Um, so what do I mean by these two different kinds of annotation? Well, automatic annotation is carried out um, within the Ensemble project, and it's carried out for every single species that we have in our database. The manual annotation is carried out by the Havana team, um, who have close links with us here in Ensemble, and this is carried out for a much smaller number of species. So what's involved in these two different methods? So automatic annotation um, is genome-wide determination using the Ensemble automated pipeline. This pipeline works by taking um, experimental biological data, so known proteins and cDNAs, and then plotting them onto the genome using sequence matching. This is quite a quick process. It can be done in a couple of weeks for an entire genome. Um, but it can sort of make um, mistakes at times. The biological evidence we use, uh, we use um, data from the INSDC. Um, so that's the ENA, GenBank, and DDBJ. These are all databases where you can submit um, nucleotide sequences. So we use cDNAs um, from these databases. They are shared between, um, so all of the data in ENA is also in GenBank and DDBJ because they do um, data sharing every 24 hours. So we use the cDNAs from there. We use protein sequences from Uniprot. We use both the manually curated SwissProt um, protein sequences, and we use the unreviewed translations um, from Tremble, which is basically translated cDNAs from the INSDC. And we also use NCBI RefSeq. Um, so this is manually annotated proteins and mRNAs um, from, from NCBI. Um, and we plot all of these sequences onto the genome. Now the huge, the sort of limit that we have when working with these kinds of data is always what is in the databases. Um, so the majority of the data that is in all of these data databases is from human because that's what people are, majority of people are producing sequences for, um, putting into the, the sequence databases, publishing papers on so that they can then be manually um, curated and annotated. Quite a lot are from mouse and quite a lot are from zebrafish as well. But once we get into other species, we find that the number um, annotated in these databases is somewhat limited. So we get a little bit creative. Uh, one of the things we use is homology to other species. So for example, chimp genes um, were largely annotated by mapping human cDNAs and proteins onto the chimp genome. Um, obviously, this is ever so slightly less reliable than using chimp proteins. But if they're not available, we make do with what we've got. We also use a lot of RNA-seq data, um, so people will, will do analyses of, of whole transcriptomes, um, and we will plot those, those um, transcriptomes onto the database, onto the genome, use these to produce our gene models, and again, we go back to the homology because obviously the RNA-seq data has no background data about what each of the reads is, so we need to use the homology um, in order to say that's BRAF, for example, um, by mapping it back to, to a homologous genome. So manual gene annotation is very, very different. Um, it is done by a, sorry, somebody's going through doors. I hope that didn't make a loud noise. Um, it's done on a case-by-case -case basis by um, a human being. Um, so each gene will take about half a day. A chromosome takes about six months. And they will sit and they will analyze um, a gene one by one, look at all of its different splice variants, analyze um, the splice sites very carefully, things like 
the transcription start site and transcription end site, they put a lot of effort into them, um, and non-coding um, transcripts, non-coding genes um, are very well annotated by manual gene annotation. So this is done by the Havana Group. Um, it's done on a genome-wide basis for human, mouse, zebra, fish, pig, and rat, and there's a smaller number um, of transcripts available for some other species. And you can understand why it's not done on um, such a scale as, as the, the automatic annotation, because obviously it does take um, much longer in order to get that kind of quality annotation. Um, you do find that with manual annotation you get a lot more um, sort of non-coding transcripts, a lot more transcripts where the, the data behind them might be a little bit more dubious, but it's, that data has been examined and decided that it is good enough. With automatic annotation you kind of have to set a threshold and say that's it, this is what we'll allow and that's what we, we won't allow, whereas manual gene annotation can be a lot more fre flexible, which means it's a lot more comprehensive. Um, so gen code is just, um, it's essentially a label um, for the gene set um, that we have, so it's made up of the automatically annotated genes um, and the manually annotated genes and the merged gene set in um, human and mouse. Um, and it's the default gene set used by ENCODE, Thousand Genomes and other um, major projects. It's a bit of a branding exercise really because it is essentially the same as the gene set that we have already. So the golden transcripts, these are the high confidence and quality. Another place where you'll find high confidence and quality is CCDS. So CCDS stands for Consensus Coding DNA Sequence Set, and it's an agreement between not just um, Ensemble and Havana, but also UCSC and NCBI. So where are coding sequences, so this is ignoring um, the UTRs, where the coding sequences match up with the rest coding sequence, um, that coding sequence is assigned a CCDS. Now because these don't have UTRs, we keep them separate um, to, the, to the main transcript set. We will like, identify when a transcript has a CCDS, um, but we don't plot them separately onto the genome. Um, and this is available for both human and mouse. So the higher qual quality transcripts are things to look out for, for are the CCDS um, and the GenCo, just um, a few Venn diagrams summing up how these things overlap because I know people get quite confused about them. One of the things we always get asked when people um, go into Ensemble and look at a list of, of transcripts for a gene and find that it has 20 transcripts, um, they say, which one should I use for my analyses? Practically, um, from a, a purist perspective, you should use all of them, um, but from a practical perspective, we understand that um, you can't, often can't be analysing that number of transcripts um, in one analysis. You've got a limit to, to your lab resources. Um, so one of the things you might do is uh, you might narrow it down and, and pick your favourites. So one of the things you can use is, is GenCode Basic. Um, and this is um, uses only the complete transcript. So um, some of our transcripts will be missing um, five prime ends, some will be missing the three prime end, um, the proteins may be missing an N terminus or a C terminus. Um, because we're trying to annotate everything that's out there, there is incomplete data in the databases. We want to give you all the information um, that you can get. So, But if you only want to see the complete things, if you just want to ignore stuff that's incomplete, you can use GenCode Basic. We also have transcript support level. This is a score between one and five for quality, um, where one is the best, and we do have a glossary um, term that describes in detail what each of these support levels mean. Um, we also work with APRIS um, who produce a principal isoform. Um, they define this as the major isoform from the combining protein structural information, functionally important residues and evidence from cross-species alignments. So they manually, annotate, manually analyze all of the transcripts of a protein and pick um, the principal isoform and there are some other um, classifications that they use as well. You will see these tags that I've got shown um, on the screen here next to, to transcripts in the table and if you hover over them they will define um, what they mean. I'll show you that uh, when we get into our walkthrough. Add this in with your CCDS and your golden transcripts, you start to be able to narrow it down. You can probably, um, for, in most cases, get it down to one, possibly in some cases two transcripts um, to use in your analyses. All of this is available for human and mouse. Some of it is available for um, zebrafish and rat. 
Um, just to note that for other species, you don't tend to have as many transcript numbers because you don't have the manual annotation. Um, so for most species, this is less of a problem. Um, so for the species where it is a problem, we've got the helpers. For the species where it's not a problem, there isn't the helpers. Um, you will see ensemble stable IDs. Most databases have a kind of stable ID that they use for um, for their um, proteins and genes and whatever. Um, we are no exception. Stable IDs are brilliant because they remain stable regardless of changes in gene name um, and things like that. So our stable IDs consist of um, ENS telling you it's ensemble, followed by GTPE, etc., standing for gene, transcript, peptide, exon, and then an 11-digit number which is unique. Uh, for non-human species, a suffix is added. So for mouse, that is MUS. Um, for zebrafish, it's DAR. And we do have a list. If you are looking for your favourite species, have a look at the list of all of the, the three-letter codes um, to find your favourite species. Um, we also have gene ontology attached um, to genes. Um, and gene ontology is a way of describing function. Uh, gene ontology is really, really um, useful. Um, and it solves two major problems. Um, the first problem it solves is, um, so obviously, when you when you describe what a gene does, you can write a paragraph and um, very human readable paragraph that describes exactly what a gene does. You can say my gene is involved in innate immunity. It does blah blah blah, and you can write that in your paper, and that is completely readable by another human being. The trouble is it's not so readable by a computer. Um, one of the reasons is that there are multiple terms for the same thing. So your paper that talks about your gene that's involved in innate immunity um, would not be found by someone who does a computer search for non-specific immunity um, because computers don't necessarily know what all the synonyms are. Another problem it would solve is specificity. You could have written a paper about um, your gene that's involved in um, phagocytosis and have never used either phrase innate immunity or non-specific immunity because why would you need to? You've said phagocytosis, it's, it's, that covers it. Um, but that means that every, somebody searching papers for, for every gene involved in innate immunity would again not find your gene, not find your paper. So you write all these things in your paper and what happens is um, gene ontology come along and they add what are called go terms to your genes based on what they read in your paper. So they, these go terms are a controlled vocabulary. So there's a specific go term, innate immune response, and that's the term that somebody reading your paper, whatever you happen to have written, um, if your gene is involved in innate immune response and you have described some way that it is, this is the term that will be added onto your gene. And this is the term that can then be searched in a database. The other thing that, that solves this is that they're hierarchical. So ontology um, means a, a, a sort of controlled vocabulary with the hierarchy. So this term, innate immune response, um, is a daughter term of another go term, immune response. And it, in turn, has a num number of other um, daughter terms. And you'll see that these are very specific descriptions of um, features of the innate immune response. So if I were to, to write a paper and the go term virus-induced gene silencing were to be attached onto my um, gene, somebody doing a, a search, um, if you use a search engine that's ontology aware, anybody searching for innate immune response would not just find genes that had the term innate immune response attached, but they would also find terms, um, genes that had all of these other terms attached to them as well. So it's a really nice way of describing um, what genes do in a way that computers can search, not just that people can read, um, because computers aren't as clever as people yet. So we're going to have a look at a, an ensemble gene called ESPN, and we're going to find out some information about it and its transcripts. So I'm going to jump out of my presentation here, and I'm going to go into the ensemble genome browser. Um, I'll just close this cookies warning. Um, so I'm at ensemble.org, um, which Helen showed you um, in the last webinar. And I'm going to put my gene of interest into the search box. Um, so I'm going to type ESPN, and I'm going to hit go. 
So here's um, the human gene at the top of my search results. You'll see it goes into transcript. Um, so the search is quite nice. You didn't see this in the, the last one. Um, it has a kind of search facets down the side. So in some cases, I might not have found my gene straight away, so I might want to narrow it down so I can just see genes. Now you'll see I get the human gene first. I get the mouse gene next. Um, and if I still haven't found it, I could narrow it down again to human. And you'll see that I've got the gene, and then this one is a, a RefSeq um, gene. So I'm going to hit the, the, um, the gene name, and this takes me to the gene tab. Um, so we have this system of tabbing where at the top here, um, as you open up different kinds of features, so we've got the location, we've got the gene, and we'll see that as we open up the transcript, we'll get another tab appearing right here. This allows us to jump between features. If we've got multiple features open, we can go between the different ones um, very simply. Um, so what we can see on this gene summary page is a kind of summary, a description of the gene. There's a table of transcripts which I can show or hide using this blue button here. And below I've got a, a graphical representation um, of the gene. So we can see the different transcripts. We can see that this one has this one, um, gold one here, um, is a merged transcript. We've got a number of protein coding ones, these red ones. We've got a few non-coding ones. We can see it's positive stranded because it's above this blue bar. I also have this menu down the left. And this menu down the left um, is specific to the gene tab. And it shows me all of the, all of the possible views that I can see for a gene. So anything I might want to see about a gene is shown in this menu on the left. And you'll see as we go to different tabs, we get different menus um, with all the possible views. So the first one I'm going to visit is sequence. Um, so what it's showing me is it's showing me the sequence of the gene. It's showing me um, exons highlighted with this kind of peach background. Um, but not all of the exons are exons of, of ESPN, my gene of interest. We've got this exon here, so we've got 600 bases upstream and downstream. There's an exon of a neighboring gene um, in this 600 bases upstream. Excuse me. Um, this ESPN exon is shown here with this kind of red text. And as I scroll down, you see I go into an intron, and then I find another um, exon. And I would find that all the way to the bottom. Um, as we saw with the, the region view last week, we can configure the sequence um, view. So look, look out for these buttons here, um, which will give you options to configure, to download, etc. Um, so I'm going to click on configure this page. And you can see I can change the amount of flanking sequence. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to show variants on this sequence. So I'm going to say yes and show links. And um, I'm also going to add in line numbering, which I'm going to do relative to this sequence. So it will start with one. Um, and as before, I click on the tick to save and close. So it takes a moment to load with this. Um, you have to think a bit about uh, what, it's, what it's adding on. Um, but it will very shortly show me um, the sequence with the, um, the highlighting. I could very easily just drop this sequence directly into Blast. It's, it's now loaded up my um, legend. Um, I can also download this sequence. Um, if I click download sequence, I can download in two different formats. Uh, one, option, one option is Fast A. This is what I might want to use if I was going to drop the sequence into some kind of sequence analysis tool. Um, the other option is rich text format, which can be opened in things like Word. Um, and this is what I might want to use if I wanted to keep all the sequence highlighting and things on it. If I wanted to kind of examine it manually um, and look at it myself, then I might download it in rich text. I'm going to close this because I don't actually want to download any sequence today. Um, and you'll see while I was waiting for that, um, it's loaded up with all of these variants highlighted um, onto the sequence, which I could click on and find out a bit more about them um, if I wanted to. So we're going to explore some more of the, the links um, on the left. I mentioned Go terms. Um, Go is split into three categories, biological process, what the gene does, molecular function, how it does it, and cellular component, where in the cell it does it. I'm going to go into biological process. And we're going to see some of the terms um, associated 
with this gene. So we've got uh, sensory perception of sound, locomotory behavior, parallel actin bundle filament assembly. So we start to get a picture of, of what um, this gene actually does. These evidence codes um, say how this, this um, goterm was attached. Because goterms attached to proteins uh, rather than genes themselves, we have the transcripts IDs of the proteins. Um, and I can also search Biomark, for example, for this goterm, find all the, the genes that are associated. Um, and we'll talk about Biomart in the next uh, webinar. So we do have a lot of data in Ensemble. There's lots of interesting stuff here. But we are not a one-stop shop for everything you might want to know about a gene. Um, and we do recommend exploring other databases. And we make that easy for you with our external references, which are shown near the bottom here. Here we have some links out to other databases which have data on this gene. Um, so, for example, you might want to go to Expression Atlas if you wanted to see a bit more about um, where this gene is expressed. You might want to go to, to um, OMIM or MIM, uh, Mendelian Inheritance in Man, um, if you want to get a really sort of texty, um, verbose description about the gene function and how it was discovered and all that kind of thing, um, for example. Um, we do. We can get a kind of overview of the expression if I go into gene expression. So, um, for a detailed version, I go to Expression Atlas. If you want to get a quick overview, we have a little link here, um, and we actually have a little widget that was made for us um, by our friends at Expression Atlas. They're they're here in UBI um, with us. Um, so what we have is we have a table um, of different experiments um, and different tissues. So um, showing us where it was expressed. So in this um, developing brain, um, if I hover over this, you'll see on the little man, um, we've got some purple highlighting coming up. So as I hover over the different um, the different experiments, you can see in that experiment where they identified. You can also see it in this table, um, with, and you can kind of hover over the, the factors to, to get more information. If you want this information in detail, I do recommend clicking through um, to Expression Atlas, and there is a link here. Um, just if you want, if you're looking at um, sex-specific organs and you want to see expression in sex-specific organs, you can switch from a man um, to a lady. It's not doing it. There we go. Um, and if you're looking at brain-specific expression, you can also switch to a brain. So some of these. Um, there we go, we can highlight just in the brain. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about the individual transcripts, um, this gene has 17 of them. Um, one place you can go is the transcript comparison view. I really like this view because I think it's really useful for um, designing RT-PCR primers. So at the moment it's showing me nothing, um, but at the bottom of this page I've got this button which is just breathing at me, it's going in and out, and it's desperately trying to get me to click on it. Um, so I will I will um, placate it um, by clicking, and this now allows me to select transcripts that I want to see. So I can select them one by one, and you'll see they move over onto the selected transcripts, or I can select all the protein coding transcripts, for example. If I now save and close this, what it's going to show me is the transcript sequences lined up on top of each other. Um, so here we are, we've got just the sequence of the whole gene, ESPN, and then we have the sequence of um, one of the transcripts, ESPN001. This is its untranslated region. It is sort of loading stuff up as I talk, so it is jumping about a bit. So this um, orange is its untranslated region. 201 is also transcribed right from the beginning, and then you'll see that it, oops, I've lost it. At this point, both of us, both of them, um, go into to being translated, and then we go into into intron for both of them. And as I go further down, about two thirds down, I start to get kind of multiple um, transcripts. So you can see which bits of sequence belong to all of the transcripts, which bits of sequence belong to only one of the transcripts. And so this is really useful if you want to get either you want to get really specific with your RT PCR and you want to know exactly which transcript it is amplifying, 
or you want to be really non-specific with the RT-PCR and you say I just want to amplify all of them, I don't want to differentiate, this can help you identify um, which um, exon exon boundaries are the ones that will, will give you that. Um, so I'll go back up to the top and I'm going to open up the transcript table and have a look at these transcripts again um, and some of the information about them. So this one at the top um, ESPN001, we can see that it's protein coding, um, it's gold so it's got the two different kinds of annotation, um, we can see it's got a CCDS associated with it, we can jump to its Uniprot and Rexix, um, and we can see the transcript support level 1, it's GenCode basic, it's um, complete, and it's a uh, principle 2 by a priest, um, so it's a candidate principalized form. They think it possibly is, but they're not totally sure because there's some others um, that are questionable. So I'm going to click on the transcript ID, which is going to take me into the transcript tab. So you see I've still got this gene tab, but now I've got the transcript tab alongside it. And I've got a new menu down the left, which has got a bunch of um, transcript specific pages that I can look at. I'm going to hide this transcript table again because it is quite large, it takes up a lot of space. This is just a landing page so it doesn't have a huge amount of data on it but we do have a summary um, of the structure. So I mentioned kind of supporting evidence, transcript support level, things like that. We can actually see that kind of data in more detail if I go into supporting evidence. So this page shows me the transcript structure along the top and then it shows me all the evidence from other databases that we use to construct this. Um, so we have evidence that supports the whole transcript so we've got um, we've got this RefSeq, we've got this um, protein. If I click on them either on the structures themselves um, or the names it gives me a link um, to RefSeq or to wherever it is so I can go out and I can see um, the original data that was used to construct this. We also have evidence that supports individual exons um, from the manual, an the, sorry, the automatic annotation from Ensemble and the manual annotation from Havana. So we can see that different bits of evidence were used um, by the two different processes and you can see that the Havana annotation used a lot more of these um, short um, express sequence tags. So um, there are sequence views as well for the transcript. One that I quite like is the exons view. Again, a good one for RT-PCR um, because we have the sequence of each of the exons shown in a kind of table form um, and the introns are kind of collapsed down. You could expand them out if you wanted to. That's an option um, within the configure this page. Um, you can hide them completely or you can expand them out. But because we've got these exons listed separately, you've got a little bit more, you can see kind of where the boundaries are um, quite clearly. Um, we also have the exon IDs, um, the start and end and the length as well. I like the cDNA sequence view for looking at variation um, and the reason for this is I can compare the variance between the, the cDNA sequence and the protein sequence because it actually consists of, of three different sequences. Um, so we have the cDNA shown along the top um, the second line is the um, CDS coding sequence and the third line is the amino acid sequence and it's quite nice for looking at variants because you can see where we've got a variant highlighted. We also have the associated um, amino acid um, highlighted where that is relevant. This is our um, untranslated region shown in yellow here. We can see alternating codons. Um, I don't know how well it's showing up on your screen but it goes sort of white, yellow, white, yellow um, for each of the codons and here you can see we've got a switch in text colour. So we go from black text to blue text um, which is telling us that we're, we're now going into the next exon. So it's not as clear as the exons view for looking at when we, we switch exons but that information is there. Um, as with the gene, the transcript has um, lots of data about it in other databases, particularly things like protein databases. So if we go into general identifiers um, on the left here, you'll see we have a, a list of links out to, to some of the cDNAs, um, 
the protein sequences and things like that in other databases. So if you want to find out more um, about the protein, um, in some cases we have um, structures from PDBE. Um, we don't in this case, but that's something you might want to go to um, from here if you're interested in protein structure. We have a little bit of information, minimal information um, on kind of protein structure. If you go into protein summary, we can show you where the protein domains are. Um, so here we have the structure of the protein, the purple, the two different shades of purple tell us when we're moving between different exons. Um, and we have the domains plotted on. These were plotted using Interproscan. Um, so Interproscan uses a number of different um, domain prediction algorithms, so Prosite, PFAM, Smart, Superfamily. It runs all these different algorithms to plot um, different domains onto the protein um, sequence. The reason it runs all of these different um, algorithms rather than just picking one and saying this is the best um, is that the different um, algorithms have different strengths and weaknesses um, so some of them will be very good at plotting one particular kind of domain others will be better at plotting other um, types of domains so if you're interested in this kind of thing it's worth reading up on the different prediction methods to find out which one is best for the kind of domains that you're working with um, you'll see that the kind of they often predict very similar domains so we've got an anchor and repeat domain predicted by superfamily smart prints Prosite, Gene3D, sorry, not Prince, um, that's the one that hasn't got it. But they've all given it slightly different boundaries because um, their methods are ever so slightly different. Some are a bit more specific, some are a bit more general. Um, and we have the, the SNPs um, plotted against this as well. If you like this kind of data, but you're more of a table person, you prefer to look at tables rather than graphics, um, you can go into domains and features and you'll see exactly the same data um, as a table. Um, so this is just sort of, um, there are other links on the left hand side um, and we will go into in both the, the transcript tab and the gene tab and in some of the later webinars we will go into some of these in more detail such as variant tables um, in the variation webinar, um, the orthologs and paralogs pages in the Compara webinar. Um, but for now, I'm going to um, go back to my presentation and just give you a bit of a sum up um, of what we've um, of, of what's happened today. So the next webinar is um, Biomart Data Export with Biomart, um, which is a really nice tool for um, specifying what ensemble data features you want to get data for um, and printing data into a table um, that you can use. And Victoria will be giving that. Um, next week um, and I have seen Ben and Victoria busily typing away so I'm assuming that there have been a few questions um, appeared in the chat box um, when I've wrapped up this webinar I'll just take a look and see if there are any more um, that we want to go over uh, verbally at the end of this um, do have a look at the course exercises um, Obviously, we can't mandate that you, you do these exercises, but we strongly urge everyone to. Um, we find that it really is the best way to learn, to, to properly practice um, using the, the, the stuff that you've learned in the course of the webinar. Um, if you have a go, you'll find that it really kind of beds that information in. Um, and you can, of course, as we mentioned, get help. Um, there is plenty of other help available. Um, we have online courses. Some of you will have found this course through um, EBI Train Online, but we have a number of other courses on EBI Train Online, and there are um, other general sort of bioinformatics um, courses introducing you, some of them to specific EBI resources and some of them to kind of conceptual background courses on EBI Train Online. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, we have other, other tutorials available. We have some um, animations available on YouTube and our UQ channel if you can't access YouTube. Um, you can also email us, helpdesk at ensemble.org, um, or contact our public mailing list. So Dev, Dev is really good if you're looking at Ensemble from a development uh, developer's perspective, if you're doing sort of coding against our database, you might want to join Dev um, and ask questions there, and announce this for finding out about things like our releases. 
Um, please do follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter. Um, we have a, a blog where we talk a lot about um, kind of background stuff on new data that we get. If you use our data, please do cite us. Um, um, we have lots of publications out and we, we like being cited. Um, and this is just uh, to thank the entire team um, who work on putting together um, all of this data and all of the, the interfaces as well as all of our funders um, who allow us to not just to put out this database but allow us to do things like deliver free training um, as we're doing right now um, for, for all of the um, people around the world so we are very very grateful to our funders.